Good morning. The unfunded mandates, regulatory burdens, and the role of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs um, hearing will come to order this morning. Um, the Oversight Committee mission statement, we begin every single one of our meetings with it. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have the right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. Second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty in the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers do have the right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with Citizen Watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Specifically, today we are dealing with the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act of 1995, or UMRA. Uh, it was to set the Federal mandates on uh, State, local, and tribal governments in the private sector by shedding light on expected economic impact of pending statutes and regulations. Under UMRA, each agency is to assess the effect of each type of nonfederal entity of regulatory actions it plans to take. UMRA was to help inform Congress of the potential burden of laws and regulatory actions might impose so that those could be weighed against the potential benefits. But in the subcommittee's two prior hearings on UMRA, we heard from representatives of State and local governments in the private sector that UMRA is not identifying all of the unfunded mandates being imposed on them, and it does not always capture the full cost of those mandates that it does identify. In fact, in the past 10 years, only four rules have been classified as constituting unfunded mandates on State, local, and our tribal governments under UMRA. Further, only 13 of 66 major rules issued in 2010 were classified as unfunded mandates. Only one of the 13 was identified as an intergovernmental mandate. I have two different slides I want to be able to show on that one. The first one deals with just the number of economically significant rules in the pipeline. You will see that has continued to grow over the years. And the second one gives us a snapshot of the major economically significant regulations in 2006 to 2010. In the purple there, you will see those are regulations subject to UMRA review, that very small little part. The red there is major regulations reviewed by OIRA, and then the green there are major regulations that have been issued as a whole. Uh, so obviously we have several that are slipping through the mix here that are not being evaluated by UMRA. While I appreciate President Obama's recognition of the burdens that the Federal Government puts on State, local, and tribal governments in his Presidential Memorandum on Administrative Flexibility, Lower Costs, and Better Results for State, Local, and Tribal Governments, this is not a substitute for legislation to ensure the burdens placed on these entities are fully recognized and taken into account. As the charts that we just looked at show, when you look at the number of major regulations issues, major, reg major regulations in the pipeline, and those reviewed by OIRA, you see a rising trend of major regulations from the Federal Government. This is one recent indication that UMRA statute is failing to live up to its promise of reducing unfunded mandates. It is time to look at closing some of UMRA's loopholes, exemptions, and exceptions that this subcommittee has heard about from its previous two hearings on unfunded mandates. We need to examine whether the cost estimates under UMRA are being accurately reflected. UMRA only captures direct costs or expenditures, not the total effects on the economy, as required under Executive Order 12866. UMRA thresholds are based on adjustments for inflation, but it is my understanding that is not the case for Executive Order 12866. UMRA also does not take into account the need to prepare for an unfunded mandate by a local government or private business. During the first UMRA hearing in February, the subcommittee heard testimony from the Government Accountability Office, local government representatives, and the former OIRA Administrator, Susan Dudley. Ms. Dudley, who served as the OIRA Administrator from 2007 to 2009, provided expertise and insight in the process by which the Federal Government imposes unfunded mandates on non-Federal parties. She also described widely recognized flaws that exist within the current UMRA statute and suggested multiple remedies and potential legislative solutions to address the concerns shared by many affected parties. At the subcommittee's second hearing on UMRA in March, the subcommittee heard from witnesses representing State governments and the private sector. During the hearing, the subcommittee heard from the chief economist of the Small Business and Entrepreneur Council uh, regarding how unfunded mandates and regulations continually stifle private sector growth and economic expansion. Glad to see that, uh, that uh, President Obama shares the same concerns that Mr. Keating articulated uh, to the subcommittee at our March hearing. I welcome his Executive Order 13563 and the public statements on regulations. Indeed, the President has stated that sometimes rules have gotten out of balance, placing unreasonable burdens on businesses, burdens that have stifled innovation and have had a chilling effect on growth and jobs. Further, President Obama made it crystal clear to the American people in a Presidential memoranda that my administration is firmly committed to eliminating excessive and unjustified burdens on small businesses and to ensure that regulations are designed with careful consideration of their effects, including their cumulative effects on small businesses. In light of this backdrop, it seems very appropriate that we would look at reforming UMRA, not only in, in the context of the State, local, and tribal governments, but also with the private sector as well. Many regulations are on tap, will not be covered by UMRA in its current form or, for that matter, in Executive Order 12866. 
For example, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce estimates the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act and Consumer Protection Act signed into law by the President contains 259 mandated rulemakings, 188 suggested rulemakings, 63 reports, and 59 studies. Most of these rules, those not issued by the Treasury Department, will be issued through independent regulatory agencies such as the SEC, Commodities Future Trading Commission, FDIC, Federal Reserve, and the newly created CFPB, which are exempt from the requirements of OMRA, as well as Executive Orders 12866 and 13563. All these new rulemakings create potential for the issuance of more unchecked, unfunded mandates. Indeed, in light of the President's recent statements, it is curious that a recent report by George Washington University Regulatory Studies Center and the Wiedebaum Center in Washington University in St. Louis finds that the number of staff employed on regulatory matters within the Federal Government is on schedule to grow to a rate of about 10,000 new regulatory employees per year in 2011 and 12. The number of full-time regulatory employees is, is expected to reach an all-time high of 291,676 in 2012. The authors of the report, which include former OIRA Administrator Susan Dudley, believe this data offers useful information on the composition and evolution of Federal regulation over the past 52 years and serve as a barometer of future regulatory activity. I have stated before, and will state again with this hearing, like other hearings, this is not an attack on the current administration. Many of the issues we will deal with today did not originate during this administration, and the solutions we propose will extend well beyond this administration. It is essential that we look at the bigger picture and the long-term effects to our Federal involvement in State, local, and Tribal governments and private business operation. But it is also essential that each agency is evaluated on their results, not just their rhetoric. Today's hearing is designed to be another teachable moment to discover the facts to assist us in developing solutions. It is the role and responsibility of this subcommittee and Congress as a whole to ensure this administration is regulating in the best interests of the American people. I am here to make certain in this modern regulatory environment the Federal Government does not overstep its clearly defined constitutional boundaries and well-intentioned bureaucrats don't impose their preferences on State, local, and tribal governments and private industry. It is my hope that we can also discern issues that must be addressed in a legislative solution to our unfunded mandates. I would like to now recognize the distinguished ranking member, Mr. Connolly, for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I want to thank you uh, and our uh, ranking member, Mr. Connolly, for this hearing. This is the third hearing this subcommittee has held on uh, the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act. Having heard from State, local, and tribal officials at previous hearings, I am grateful that Mr. Sunstein is uh, here today to provide us with the Administration's perspective on this important issue. The original purpose of UMBRA, which was passed in 1995, was to make Congress more accountable when imposing new Federal mandates on State, local, and tribal governments. As a former member of the Maryland House of Delegates, I am sensitive to the budgetary pressures facing State and local governments. It is important for Congress and agencies to carefully evaluate and balance the potential impact before imposing new requirements on small governments. However, this is also the fourth hearing in which this subcommittee has stressed only the burdens imposed by regulations. There is a common assumption in the titles and the focus of these hearings that regulations are burdensome and hinder economic recovery. Yet we know that regulations are necessary to protect the health, welfare, and safety of the American public, of our constituents, by the way. As Mr. Sunstein has often stated, we also know that some regulations create jobs. As I have said in the past, I fully support a comprehensive review of regulations to ensure that they are effective and efficient. That must be a very balanced review. But a review cannot be one-sided. It is important that we base any review on the facts rather than the rhetoric. Here are the facts. In 2011, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs estimates that the annual benefits of major Federal regulations issued between 2000 and 2010 are between $136 billion and $651 billion. In contrast, the estimated annual costs are between $44 billion and $62 billion. In other words, economic benefits of regulations are up to 10 times the cost. This conclusion is not limited to the Obama administration. In 2008, the Bush administration estimated that the annual benefits of regulations issued between 1997 and 2007 ranged from $122 billion to $656 billion, while the estimated annual cost range was from $46 billion to $54 billion. According to both the Obama and Bush administrations, the benefits of these regulations greatly outweigh the costs. 
the context, in the context of UMRA, the reality is that State and local governments are often the direct beneficiaries of Federal regulation. We must ensure that industry addresses the costs they impose on their society in the form of pollution, defective or deceptive products, and, and unsafe uh, workplaces, again, to protect the American people, our constituents. This can and does save local governments from significant expenses they otherwise would have to bear themselves to protect the health and well-being of their citizens. Administrator Sunstein, I look forward uh, to your testimony today, and I look forward to hearing more about your office's role in the regulatory process, its role in ensuring that Federal agencies are conducting a balanced review of the existing regulations under Executive Order 13563, and your efforts to improve the cost-benefit analysis. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I hope we can, and I agree with you, this must be a bipartisan effort. We must leave our political hats at the door. So I hope that we can take a fair and balanced view of regulations and that we can all work together to identify ways to help create jobs and support the work of the State and local governments while making sure that the Americans are able to live and work in safe and healthy communities. I have often said when I look at the worker and people that, this, uh, that uh, these regulations uh, often protect, I, 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 I respect those people who get up early in the morning and go to their jobs looking forward to coming home to their families. Uh, I do not want a situation where we disregard important regulations that, uh, or try to do away with uh, important regulations that are needed to protect them. I, I want them to come home to their families. Uh, and I do not want them to be shipped home to their families in a coffin. And I will say that over and over again because I have seen it so many times. And so I look forward to the to testimony. And with that, I yield back. And I want to thank the, uh, the, uh, the Chairman for his courtesy. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Cummings, who is the Ranking Member of the full OGR uh, Committee. And I would like to recognize uh, Mr. Connolly, who is the Ranking Member of our subcommittee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Mr. Sunstein. Um, I appreciate, Mr. Chairman, uh, your continued interest in this subject, uh, and I also hope we uh, will have some subcommittee hearings on technology and procurement uh, at some point in the near future issues very dear to my home district. For this hearing, it is appropriate we are hearing from the Director of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, the arm of OMB which reviews proposed agency regulations. During the previous administration, OIRA uh, intervened, to, uh, intervened to block proposed regulation of greenhouse gas pollution under the Clean Air Act Amendment. The consequences of failing to prevent global warming could be severe. Recently, the Director of the Climate Analysis Section of the National Center for Atmospheric Research stated, given that global warming is unequivocal, the null hub hypothesis should be that all weather events are affected by global warming. According to the global insurance company Munich Re, the only plausible explanation for the rise in weather-related catastrophes is, in fact, climate change. Unprecedented tornadoes killed hundreds of Americans recently in Missouri, Alabama, and my home state of Virginia. And I will include for the record a recent Washington Post article discussing the connection between climate change and extreme weather. Extreme drought rivaling even the Dust Bowl is threatening viability in agriculture in the Southwest. The acidity of the ocean has increased 30 percent due to higher atmospheric carbon concentrations, threatening coastal reefs from Florida to Australia. Sea levels are rising in the Atlantic and Chesapeake Bay, threatening critical infrastructure, including National Airport and Norfolk Naval Base. As recent extreme weather has demonstrated, the devastation of climate change can reach biblical proportions. Meanwhile, opponents of regulation ignore both the benefits of regulation and the cost of failing to regulate where regulation is necessary. Empirical data repeatedly and consistently suggests that the benefits of Federal regulations outweigh the costs by considerable margins. The ranking member of the full committee just went through some of those statistics, but other examples exist as well. For example, the vehicle efficiency standards enacted in the Clean Air Act will save consumers $3,000 per vehicle by improving the average vehicle's efficiency by 30 percent. In aggregate, OMB says this regulation will produce $12.4 billion in benefits for consumers for only $3.7 billion in costs, a 4 to 1 ratio. As this subcommittee contemplates changes to UMRA, we must also include an estimate of the benefits of new regulations to the private sector 
as well as state and local governments. Based on the data, many of these regulations create significant private sector savings and should and we should understand those so we do not delay meritorious regulations in the manner that the previous Bush administration blocked regulation, for example, of greenhouse gas emissions. In addition to understanding the benefits as well as the costs of regulation, we need to do a better job understanding that new costs could be imposed, unfunded mandates could be imposed on State and local governments by curtailing Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, as some have suggested. For example, under the Ryan budget plan passed on a strict party line vote, Federal Medicaid payments would be cut by 35 to 49 percent, or $771 billion, over the next 10 years, putting enormous stress on States, localities, and families. Medicaid primarily benefits children of poor parents, seniors in nursing homes, and disabled individuals. To illustrate how important Medicaid is to seniors in nursing homes, consider these examples from my district in Northern Virginia. Renaissance Gardens in Greenspring has 148 seniors, all of whom receive Medicaid. Fairfax Nursing Center has 200 residents, 134 of whom receive Medicaid. Leewood Health Center has 132 residents, 91 of whom receive Medicaid. The ILF Nursing and Rehabilitation Center has 132 residents, 91 of whom receive Medicaid. Based on data from the American Community Survey, approximately 13.5 percent of my constituents totally receive Medicaid. That is 102,000 residents of Fairfax and Prince William counties alone. The cruelty and political toxicity of Chairman Ryan's proposed privatization of Medicare has received a great deal of attention in the press, but the evisceration of Medicaid would have a similar negative effect on individuals and especially unfunded mandates in State and local governments. If the Federal Government cuts Medicaid by 35 to 49 percent, who is going to foot the bill for nursing home costs? Um, do our colleagues propose to put seniors out on the street, or do they expect local and State governments to pick up the tab and raise taxes to cover those costs? Ultimately, slashing Medicaid is a shell game in which the House majority would shift costs to the States and localities and the families of America. The cruel proposal would create an unfunded mandate and more troubling return America to the era of the poor farm. I think we need to look at that aspect of this subject as well, Mr. Chairman. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. And all members will have seven days to submit opening statements and other exchange uh, material for the record. Uh, we will now uh, recognize our panel. Uh, we have one witness today, the Honorable Cass Sunstein. He is the Administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs from the Office of Management and Budget. Glad to be able to have you here today. Pursuant to committee rules, we do swear in uh, all witnesses before they testify. So if you please rise and raise your right hand. Thank you, sir. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that your testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Thank you. Let the record reflect the witness answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. Thank you. In order to allow time for discussion, I am going to ask you to be able to limit your opening statement. We have already uh, discussed it would be around six minutes long or so, and that is very appropriate. I would be honored to be able to receive your statement as a part of the record at this moment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will try to beat the six-minute uh, constraint, because um, uh, I am eager to hear your, your questions and concerns. Uh, I am very grateful to be here. This is a timely hearing on a crucially important topic. Uh, as the opening remarks suggest, a central goal of UMBRA is to minimize burdens on State, local, and tribal governments and also on the private sector and to make sure that those burdens are imposed only after informed and careful consideration. Uh, what I will be emphasizing here is the very close relationship between the goals of UMRA and the goals of the Presidential Memorandum on Administrative Flexibility from February and the goals of the Executive Order on Regulation and Regulatory Review from this past January. Uh, as you are aware, Title II of UMRA, our principal focus here, imposes reporting and consultation requirements with respect to certain rules in imposing mandates that may result in the annual expenditure of $100 million or more on State, local, and tribal governments or on the private sector, all of those. These reporting requirements involve, among other things, a careful assessment of costs and benefits, as well as an accounting of various potential effects on the economy. 
And in these respects, UMRA from 1995 uh, has a clear relationship to President Reagan's Executive Order 12291 from the early 1980s. Uh, the Office of Management and Budget, uh, where I am privileged to work, is directed to provide annual reports to Congress on new regulations covered by UMRA. So there is an important informational and reporting role that uh, my office uh, has. Insofar as the statute is designed to require analysis of the effects of rules in advance and to try to reduce burdens and costs, it has a clear connection with Executive Order 12866 from the Clinton administration, which has long governed the process of regulatory review. Uh, more recently, President Obama has issued Executive Order 13563, which reaffirms the requirements of 1286 and also contains a number of provisions that bear directly on the goals of UMRA. I would like to give particular attention to four of those provisions from this January to underline their relationship with UMRA. Uh, first, the new executive order specifically directs regulations to be based on the open exchange of information and perspectives among State, local, and tribal officials and the public as a whole. With this direction, what the executive order is trying to do is to ensure consultation in advance with those who are likely to be affected by regulation. Second, the executive order, the new one, requires that before even issuing a notice of proposed rulemaking, before anything appears in the Federal Register, the agencies are supposed to seek the views who are likely to be affected, including those who are potentially subject to the relevant rulemaking. What this means is that the President has required, with clarity beyond that we have seen from any previous President, uh, advanced consultation with those who are potentially burdened by rules. Third, the executive order takes new steps to require burden reduction and minimization of cost. Agencies are directed to select the least burdensome approaches, to minimize cumulative costs, to simplify and harmonize overlapping regulations, which can often be confusing and very expensive, and to identify and consider flexible approaches that maintain freedom of choice for the American public. It is clear that these requirements bear directly on rules from state, local, and that affect state, local, and tribal governments, as well as the private sector. Fourth and finally, the new executive order requires a regulatory look back through the uh, creation of plans by which agencies and departments will eliminate excessive costs and burdens. Uh, revise rules that are too complicated and confusing, streamline rules that have uh, too much red tape, and that applies directly to State, local, and tribal governments as well as the private sector. Uh, there is a sibling to the executive order, the Presidential Memorandum on Administrative Flexibility, which draws explicit attention to requirements that have been sometimes onerous, that is a quotation, and unnecessary, that is also a quotation. With references of that sort, the memorandum seeks to increase flexibility for nonfederal entities. To that end, it directs the Office of Management and Budget, the director, in fact, to lead a process of consultation to promote increased flexibility. The presidential memorandum also requires agencies to work with state, local, and tribal governments to improve program outcomes, including reduction and streamlining of duplicative reporting, paperwork, and regulatory requirements. It should be clear that UMRA, the new executive order, and the administrative flexibility memorandum are mutually reinforcing. We are greatly looking forward to working with you on implementing and promoting the purposes of the, of the three sets of requirements, and I look forward now to answering your questions. Thank you, sir, and you did successfully beat your time there. Let me, uh, I'm going to uh, yield myself five minutes in the questioning time. We will probably do two rounds of questions, as I had mentioned to you before. If there are additional things, we will continue to hold our conversation. Uh, can I just give you a, a general statement that we also gave to Susan Dudley when she was here? Uh, wh what have you learned from the unfunded mandates, uh, the application of 12866, and now for you all the 13563 uh, executive orders that you would suggest goes into an updated writing of an UMRA law, that you would see these are deficiencies, this existed in UMRA? 
or did not exist in UMRA. It does exist in the executive orders, or these are ways to be able to fix it. So that is just a general question to you. Okay. I will tell you the most important thing I have learned that bears on all of those, uh, and that is the crucial importance of public participation to good regulatory outcomes. So uh, I taught administrative law for many years. Uh, there is a cliché among administrative law professors that by the time a rule goes out for public comment, it is baked, it is cooked, right. and the, the public comments are, are not that important. I have learned that that cliché is false. And to get rules right, it is very important to engage with the public. Okay. Okay. Uh, with that, I heard you mention that as well. H how do you select who gives the public comment, since this is not an open, large-scale process, it is not already out there? Um, obviously, there has to be some sort of notification behind the scenes as far as who gets public comment. If it is a State, if it is a tribal government, if it is a private entity, uh, who, who selects that? They're, they're, uh, the, the best way is connected with uh, the executive order's reference to freedom of choice for the American public. So the best way is to let people who have interests and concerns voice those interests and concerns rather than having bureaucrats select people. Right. So, so there are two mechanisms for that that are built into the existing process, of which UMRA is a significant part. One is the rule goes out for public notice, and then people, and sometimes many thousands of people, uh, suggest their comments. And no one asked them or chose them. They chose themselves. Okay. The second is our offices, and this is very important for those concerned about regulatory burdens to be aware of, our office is open. Our doors are open to those who think that a proposed rule or a, a final rule is um, uh, a problem. Right. And we want to hear what they have to say. So in, in that conversation back and forth, and you mentioned that specifically using the term onerous, uh, if a regulation and a look back or whatever stage of the process it may be, whether it is already on the books and we are looking back at it or whether it is a proposed rule, if, if some groups consider it onerous and other groups do not. Uh, let me give you, for instance, if a private entity or a State or local government says this is a really onerous rule and the Federal agency says, no, it is not, who arbitrates that? Okay. Thank you for that. That is uh, well, a, a crucial thing for my office and uh, you all uh, uh, who have lawmaking authority to, right. to try to get right. Uh, what we try to do is have both an internal and external process of peer review. So uh, if a rule comes in with, uh, let's say, uh, a, a low cost estimate, and then people in the private sector or state and local government have said at some part of the process that is uh, inaccurate, we have an internal process which involves the Council of Economic Advisors, the National Economic Council, economists, and uh, informed people within the government who, tr who try to make an assessment. And there is not always literal peer review, but there is a form of external peer review, speaking colloquially, in the sense that the regulatory impact analysis goes out for public review. And uh, not infrequently, people who are affected say that cost estimate is, is inaccurate. And the question is, what, what is their evidence? And sometimes they have pretty good evidence. So who do they appeal up to? When there is a disagreement, there is public comment, there is all that back, is it within that same agency or does it come to OIRA or is there a judicial review or who reviews it and says no, uh, an outside arbitrator? Right. It definitely uh, is the ultimate decision is made by uh, the agency working with OIRA. So we ultimately have the authority uh, not to approve a regulatory impact analysis. Um, and, and that means it will be a consensual process to make sure we get it right. Okay. Let me ask a couple, couple of questions as well, then I am going to defer my time as well. Uh, the private sector, you mentioned that multiple times. In UMRA, that is very clear that it is State, local, tribal governments in the private sector. It mentions it multiple times. It defines it clearly in UMRA and the law. That that is included. It, you also made that statement several times. Uh, the President has made a statement several times. Uh, what, what is your thoughts on the private sector and regulations that are coming down on them, as well as the public sector? Is there a difference? Do we need to evaluate it the same? It is a great question. Uh, uh, we are very concerned in this economic environment with any form of costs. So it, state and local government are uh, particularly strapped, and so if there is a rule that burdens them economically, uh, the choice of the least burdensome alternative, as the executive order and UMRA require, and even the, the best alternative may not be to impose the burden at all. 
So that is one set of uh, variables. Would that be true for the private sector as well Absolutely. as for state and local governments? So, so what I was going to say is that, that even though each re raises distinctive concerns, I wouldn't want to rank one on higher in the hierarchy. If you are hitting small business hard in an economically challenging time, that, that's, uh, that's, that's a problem. Okay. Thank you. I now recognize uh, Mr. Connolly for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, presumably, Mr. Sunstein, I mean, uh, we, we hear a lot of talk in this Congress about the burden of regulation, but there is also benefit to be derived from regulation in protecting the public, and sometimes in concrete savings. Is that not true? Absolutely true. And certainly your office looks at the benefits as well as the costs. Under the President's executive order, benefits are as highlighted as costs. You know, for example, in agreeing to new fuel efficiency standards, which certainly has an impact both in the public and private sectors, uh, EPA projects that over the lifetime of a model, a 2016 model, the average consumer was, will save $3,000 and the United States will save 1.8 billion barrels of imported oil. Is that a benefit? No question. Do we put a number on that benefit? Yes. And we certainly consider that as we contemplate new regulation. Absolutely. So there is an example where we are weighing costs and benefits. Um, in looking at uh, light bulb standards, same thing. Um, EPA came up with, uh, or DOE came up with uh, an analysis that said we could save $1.4 billion with new energy efficient standards for light bulbs. That would be another benefit, presumably, from a regulation. Energy efficiency standards have benefits and impose costs. Now, when one looks at, um, let me ask, do, does your office also look at the risks of cost shifting? Um, for example, I, I spent 14 years in local government. Uh, sometimes my State government uh, conveniently would shift costs uh, onto the local governments and it would become our burden, um, and uh, that has a real cost to it. Uh, I, I mentioned in my opening statement that in the, uh, in the partisan budget that passed the House here a few months ago, uh, it slashes Medicaid funding 35 to 49 percent. That has the effect of shifting the costs of Medicaid onto State and localities and, indeed, even the private sector. Has your office looked at that issue of cost shifting as, in effect, an unfunded mandate? That is not a standard part of what our uh, role is under the Executive Order and under the Unfunded Mandates Act, but there is a, a role for the analysis to which you point uh, under uh, the rubric of distributional impacts. Uh, so if it is the case that a cost is shifted from one sector to another sector and that is a consequence of a rule, that is uh, appropriate to lay out. Now, that same budget also uh, in many respects eviscerated the ability of EPA to continue to regulate under the Clean Air Act. Has your office looked at the cost-benefit analysis over the years of the Clean Air Act? Um, we look uh, at the costs and benefits of particular rules issued under the Clean Air Act. EPA has recently issued a general report on costs and benefits. Our analysis tends to be rule by rule, though we do do some cataloging in our annual report to you. And for example, do you also look at externalities? I, I know when you, you start to get into something like global warming, it is a little harder. I mean, we know what the problems are. It is a little harder to put a, a value on averting something or mitigating something. But does your office also do that analysis as well? Absolutely. That is a significant part of the analysis of rules under the Clean Air Act. The externality which comes from uh, mortality and morbidity effects from high levels of air pollution. What about, what about more uh, uh, physical things like rise in sea levels and potential damage to coastal areas and infrastructure? Uh, the, the global warming issue poses very difficult concept, conceptual and empirical challenges in terms of uh, monetization. Uh, what has happened in the last years is there is an effort to build on existing scientific models, uh, not to uh, to, to do um, significant departures from the existing models and to incorporate them into our analysis. And they do include uh, economic costs of rising sea levels. Mm -hmm. And when we look at this um, undue burden on the private sector, and certainly none of us want an undue burden, for example, look at uh, the uh, liability cap 
a regulatory liability cap on oil companies for oil spills that is at $75 million. Obviously, if we don't address that inadequacy, all it does is shift the cost of cleanup when an oil spill occurs, such as did at Deepwater Horizon, onto the public. Is that not correct? Well, that particular issue isn't one that my office sees, because our role is to look over regulation. But you are absolutely right, regulations rather than legislation. But you are absolutely right that if there is a regulation that prevents some significant economic or uh, public health-related harm, that is part of the analysis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think I would like to uh, now go for questioning to the Chairman of the full committee, uh, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, will be brief with this question. Uh, after the election that, uh, that created an opportunity for Mr. Connolly to start calling anything that passes by the majority as, as a partisan budget and eviscerating and so on, uh, rightly after that, November 15th, I sent your department uh, a letter requesting uh, a series of, with a series of questions. And in December, I, I got a, a, a quick response that basically said, here is the public record, we will give you more. We have twice, uh, er, twice requested since responses. Will you commit today to answer questions that were asked and that you agreed to answer uh, as early as December but have not yet answered? Uh, thank you for that, Mr. Chairman. I am very focused on your concerns about uh, regulatory costs and burdens. I, I, I want to see what questions exactly, but uh, uh, We will give you the questions, but they are the questions from November 15th. I would be very happy to engage with you on, uh, on questions involving regulatory burdens. I don't have the piece of paper in front of me right now. And, uh, so it's, you've sort of, it's, it never got to you or or uh, it has been forgotten since well, November 15th of last year? Pretty good memory, but I don't remember exactly what the questions were. Well, no, I understand that you wouldn't remember the questions, but it is your signature responding on this. Unfortunately, it is an undated letter, but it came into us in December in which you said you would give us the rest of the response. I am just saying, will you commit today to keep that promise from December of last year? I, th I, th I think if there is a promise there that uh, my office made, I can commit to uh, uh, to follow okay, then uh, I'll I'll take that as a yes that uh, what you signed and said you would do you you will now do in a timely fashion. Let me uh, just ask the, the the basic question. You said you referred to the previous administration more than any other administration. Let me ask a question though about this whole this whole idea of announcing you're going to go through a rule process or an executive order, and then basically consulting, that is a great thing, and I, I think all of us on the dais would, uh, would commend that. But if, in fact, an agency announces that they are going to do something and then begins effectively compelling States or individual parties to live up to the proposed, proposed, proposed rule, isn't that contrary to good government? Well, it is very important for agencies to listen to what people have to say. So uh, if the agency hasn't carefully considered comments, then that would not be consistent with the spirit of the President's executive order or the Administrative Procedure Act. So if the administration wanted to make it clear that they were looking at something but did not want to have it be compelled as though it was a rule, they should say so in the process, shouldn't they? I'm not sure I understand exactly. Well, let me just put it clear. EPA has a policy that now what they do is they announce or give guidance to what may someday be rules, and if they get enough compliance from the States and, and other stakeholders, they never have to issue a rule, but they have changed things without ever having it. That seems to be a part of this administration's direction. And I am saying, asking you, shouldn't the administration, any agency, be clear that if rulemaking is the appropriate goal, that they make it clear that they are not looking for change in advance of rulemaking unless there is uh, a, a real emergency, and that emergency is stated and stated here on the Hill. I, I fundamentally agree with what you have just said. And uh, what I would say is the Administrative Procedure Act makes a clear distinction between guidance documents and rules. Guidance documents lack the force of law. They are not binding. They have an advisory quality. And under a memorandum from March of 2009, 
guidance documents are subject to OIRA review as our rules, and we work very closely with agencies to make right. sure that guidance documents don't become rules. And uh, the guidance from the previous administration, 13422, you revoked it, you have gone your own way. Let me ask a, a broader question, though, in addition to that, because the time is limited. Yesterday we had the EPA administrator repeatedly tell us that something was from the previous administration. In other words, permits, uh, rules, studies, and, and so on, and that they automatically appear to have been set aside to start over anew simply because this is a new administration. Don't you believe that for the most part, the binding, there is a binding authority unless, unless justified for a change from previous administrations, whether they be Republican or Democratic? My mind's going through. I taught administrative law for many years, and as you're aware, there's uh, a jurisprudence on exactly that question. Well, certainly, if you if a permit is granted under one administration, wouldn't you think that that permit is a contract with the government and should not be uh, re essentially revoked simply because there's been a change in party? That's pretty third world, isn't it? Well, rulemaking is my lane, and what I can tell you is that rules issued under the Bush administration are binding on everybody uh, until they are changed. And changed by a full rulemaking absolutely. procedure. Uh, interpretive rules and guidance documents can be changed uh, uh, more quickly, but rules typically are binding uh, un until changed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to recognize the uh, ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Sutstein, I am um, today, I come uh, concerned about Medicaid, as Mr. Connolly, I want to pick up on some of the things that he was talking about. Um, as you know, Medicaid is a vital program that serves the most vulnerable Americans in this country. As a matter of fact, Medicaid accounts for 42 percent of long-term care spending. And in a time when there are those uh, on the other side of the aisle who want to eliminate uh, the traditional Medicare, put private insurance companies in charge of health benefits and uh, cause seniors to pay more for their health care. I am concerned about the shifting to States with regard to our seniors. Um, it is the number one topic when I go into my district. Um, and as you know, programs like Medicaid and No Child Left Behind are not technically covered by UMBRA. However, we also know that the Federal Government can impose significant costs on States when it changes the conditions required to receive Federal aid. The Republican budget resolution would dramatically change Medicaid from an entitlement program into a block grant, essentially removing any guarantee of care for those least likely to be able to care for themselves, people like my mother, who is 85 years old. Medicaid would be cut by $771 billion over the next 10 years. The Congressional Budget Office analysis of the Republican budget plan estimates that the Federal Medicaid funding to States would be cut by 35 percent in 20, 2022 and by 49 percent in 2030. Whether technically covered by UMRA or not, these changes would impose a remarkable unfunded mandate on States that would uh, like to continue to provide the same level of existing coverage for, for uh, their most vulnerable citizens. Now, this subcommittee has held three hearings on unfunded mandates and offered rhetorical support for relief from Federal mandates. But when it comes to their budget resolution, it is clear that the Republicans have no problem whatsoever imposing greater costs on States and local governments. The drastic cuts to Medicaid would add significant burdens on State budgets to maintain current coverage or cover a, a, a consequent increase uh, in emergency room visits by previously Medicaid-eligible people. Administrator Sustein, have you considered how converting Medicaid into a block grant would impact the ability of States to provide care to their citizens? Uh, thank you, Congressman, for that. That, that question is, uh, I would want to defer to some of my OMB colleagues. Okay. That is uh, uh, their business, uh, right. not quite mine. And let me ask you this. If States are given less money from the Federal Government as part of a Medicaid block grant, uh, what kind of budget pressures would States likely face in maintaining existing levels of care and coverage for their most vulnerable citizens? Uh, again, that same, same answer? Yeah, my boss, Jack Liu, is the, okay. the expert on that. I am sure we will be talking to Ms. Liu at some point. And let me ask you this. What would happen to Medicaid beneficiaries who are forced 
out of coverage because of uh, program cuts or if funds from the block grant simply run out? Uh, same answer. The Federal Government increased its percentage of contribution from Medicaid costs as a recession hit. The, it, this increase resulted in States receiving an estimated $107 billion in additional funding to help defray the costs associated with increasing Medicaid enrollment. According to the Kaiser Foundation, Mr. Sunstein, for every 1 percent increase in national unemployment, Medicaid enrollment increases by 1 million individuals. Does the Republican budget block grant plan include any funding contingencies in the event of another economic downturn or a natural disaster similar to Hurricane Katrina? Uh, with uh, your indulgence, I would like to uh, note that the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, we have a, a defined and narrow rule, and there are budget colleagues who, uh, uh, who specialize in, in that sort of question. Well, let me ask you this, Mr. Sunstein. Some have suggested that UMBRA be modified by expanding its judicial review provision to allow agency rules to be delayed or invalidated if an agency fails to adequately perform the required analysis. UMRA currently includes language expressly providing that an agency's failure to perform any estimate, analysis, statement, or description under UMRA cannot be used as a basis for delaying or invalidating a rule. Removing this language limiting judicial review would be a significant change to UMRA. In 2009, GAO uh, issued a report on rulemaking process. In that report, GAO found that of the agencies reviewed, the average time needed to complete a rulemaking was four years. Uh, if UMBRA was amended to allow rules to be delayed by legal challenges, what kind of impact could that have on agencies' ability to issue rules in a timely manner? It is a very important question, and it is a, a pervasive question whether judicial review is uh, worth the candle, whether it provides uh, sufficient safeguards uh, to rely on uh, self-policing or whether uh, a judicial check is an is a important supplement. On that question, you, you pose a crucial empirical question, and I just don't, don't have the data on that. Very well. Can you get back to me on that one? Uh, we can That's it. within your purview, is it not? Well, I, I should say that it, 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 it is in my purview, though I don't know if, if uh, the information is available on what kind of incremental delay you would get from judicial. Well, do the best you can. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. Thank you. I want to uh, now yield five minutes to the Vice Chair of this committee, uh, Mr. Kelly. Professor, thanks for being here, and I appreciate your indulgence as we test out campaign strategies for the 2012 elections. Uh, but more directly, as evidence in Executive Order 13563 and Pre President Obama's uh, recent announcement that he will propose a package of regulations to, el to eliminate in the coming weeks, would you agree that the President has clearly recognized that at least some regulations and businesses are having a negative effect? Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Agree. And isn't it true that one of the purposes of UMRA is to assist Congress in its consideration of proposed legislation containing Federal mandates on the private sector? Yes, absolutely. And in fact, the law states that each agency shall assess the effects of Federal regulatory actions on State, local, tribal uh, uh, governments, and the private sector. Isn't that correct? Yes. Okay. So if the President has made that commitment, and we all agree that there is uh, th this overwhelming amount of regulation that comes out, and I have got to tell you, coming from the private sector and somebody who actually funds all these programs that are mandated, and a lot of these unfunded mandates in the direction we go, I want to ask you, is there any remedial process at all? Having sat through many, many, many audits myself, both in, in my private life and serving in, in, in a city council, when, where is the remedial process? Okay. Well, since the President issued Executive Order 13563, we have seen some significant developments. Uh, uh, dairy farmers and uh, the milk industry have not been uh, thrilled at the fact that milk has been defined as oil under the oil spill rule. And there were concerns and references to expenses, and the EPA recently exempted uh, milk and dairy from the oil spill rule. Okay. That saves $140 million annually. And I understand. Let me just, if I could, because we, we really run short in this, and I don't want to be disrespectful to you, and I know that yeah. some you are asking being asked questions that absolutely have nothing to do with what we are talking about today. But these these, these agencies that come in and the, the oversight that takes place or, the, or the, the audits that take place. My concern has always been in the private sector, that where is the private sector's role on these committees and when do we get a chance to weigh in? Because most of the time, the people that come in have never actually done 
what the people that they are over, overseeing have done and actually haven't walked in their shoes, so really don't know what it takes to run these different entities, and yet they are being regulated and mandated to do things that in some cases can't be done for a number of reasons. So where is that? Is there a process that, yes. that we actually can come to the table? I have never been invited. That is why I ask. Oh, for, for, for members? Oh, okay. Well, Not for members of the Congress. I am talking about people in the private sector. Ah, okay. Well, what we have done for the regulatory look back is to ask the public for ideas about, and we have gotten a lot about rules that are causing the sorts of problems to which you point. And those, those ideas have come in, and they are reflected in the agency plans that will be released soon. Okay, but, but I know you, you said we have asked the public, but have we actually engaged those people who are actually doing what it is that we are overseeing or, or regulating to be at the table to have some input as to what is being asked of them? Yes, the, the, there are a few mechanisms for that. Uh, we are available, that is the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs is available for meeting with people, uh, certainly on rules under review. If there are concerns about a rule on the books or a coming rule, then uh, if, if a letter is sent to me, the chance that I will read it is 100 percent. Would it happen during the regulatory process? Yes. That, that if, if a rule goes out for public comment, then there is there are And, and I am not talking about public comment. What I what am speaking of, and I, and I mean it specifically because I am involved in a lot of these right. different things, the private sector is really not consulted on a cost-benefit analysis. In fact, in your testimony it says the agency at its sole discretion. And so what that says to me is that, that is sold, it will determine. And again, I am very leery of a government that thinks it can do better than anybody else and thinks it is smarter than anybody else, but has actually never done what it is that they are trying to regulate, and it drives the cost of that up. Now, we talk about cost savings and cost benefits. I would suggest to you that that is not always the case. At the end of the day, the government decides what it is going to be. And those people who are left holding the bag or left holding the bill are not really brought to the table. And I, I, would, I would say that is more the case than not the case. Okay. You are absolutely right. Uh, for some of the high-profile, high-expense rules, including the CAFE rule, the fuel economy rule, uh, where the benefits were really high uh, and the costs were a lot lower, uh, people were brought to the table. The automobile industry was brought to the table to ask what is feasible and what is reasonable. And that is happening on an ongoing basis. And, and I understand that being an automobile dealer, I mean, while they are brought to the table, they are pretty much told what the, what the economy I mean, what, what the um, gas mileage is going to be. And there's unintended consequences, although, as we know, a lot of the things that are funded in the highway transportation are, are revenues derived from the sale of gasoline. So when you eliminate one source, it has to come up someplace else. And we have this habit down here to try and place the blame on, on when you are up to your rear end and alligators who was supposed to drain the swamp. And I think it is a little bit of bass ackwards way of doing things. And I would just suggest that while you have this ability, please, let's make sure that we get the private sector to the table. Let's get their input before we impose regulations and cost them that are really burdensome and, and cannot be done. I agree completely, and I would love to explore ways to do that going forward. I will work with you on yeah, it. Thank you. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I would like to recognize Mr. Chaffetz for five minutes. Thank you. And thank you, Administrator, for, for being here. Um, in a 2007 speech, I believe you said, quote, we ought to ban hunting, end quote. Is that something you or anybody in the administration is working on at this point? Absolutely not. Um, you had said uh, in your book, or written in your book, Radicals and Robes, quote, almost all gun control legislation is constitutionally fine. And if the court is right, then fundamentalism does not justify the view that the Second Amendment protects an individual's right to bear arms, end quote. Is that something that you or anybody in the administration is working no, on? That, that quotation actually was from a, a, a position, not a position I held at the time. I was describing a position that some okay. other people held. In any case, one thing that is very clear is what academics write in their academic capacity has exactly no appropriate bearing on what government officials do in their governmental capacity. And I appreciate it. That is why I am asking if those previous positions are something that you are currently working on now. Um, you were, I, I believe the quote is, you had said, quote, animals should be permitted to bring suit with human beings as their representatives. Is that something you are working on or anybody in the administration is working on? I am working on the implementation of Executive Order 13563 and not on those issues. Uh, let me ask uh, one more uh, specific one. Um, quote, this is something, again, the, the rights of animals, quote, there should be extensive regulation of the use of animals in entertainment, scientific experiments, and in agriculture, end quote. 
Is that something you or anybody in the administration is working on uh, well, or has worked on? I, I can't speak for all of the administration, to the best of but I would be very yeah. surprised, and I am certainly not working on those issues. Um, at the first, G at an earlier hearing, the GAO testified that one of the most frequently cited reasons that a rule was not considered to be an unfunded mandate was the fact that the rule did not go through the proposed rule stage, meaning that the agency skipped the regular process and instead issued an interim final or uh, interim final or direct final rule. Do you find concurrence with that view of what GAO came up with in their conclusions? Or? I don't actually know if, about the numbers, but I do know that the general uh, claim of, of the law, about the law is correct, that if there is no proposed rule stage, then UMRA doesn't apply. So they can just bypass that whole thing and Well, in a sense, it is bypassing. In a sense, it is built into the fabric. Uh, it is kind of hardwired into UMRA, which applies only when there is a proposed rule stage. One of the other cons concerns here is that the major exclusions from UMRA is the status of an agency as, quote, unquote, is independent. If the issuing agency is considered to be an independent regulatory agency, they are not required to conduct an UMRA analysis. So this would include the SEC, the FCC, the FTC, the CFTC, the new Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, all are not subject to UMRA. What? That's correct. What, but why? I mean, what, I, I realize you are looking back, but moving forward, it seems that these are some of the agencies are some of the most egregious and just unilateral rulemaking that is bypassing the Congress and, and causing chaos in many ways. Well, it is a very important question. Uh, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs has an implementation role. Uh, to answer that important question, there would be um, an independent process where, of course, this would be Congress's judgment, and I am sure the executive branch would have, have a view. There are some of us that are really struggling to understand where, where rulemaking should stop and where really Congress should have the ability to, to write the laws of the land. Do you see any conflict with the rules as it relates to the separation of powers and Congress's ability and mandate to actually institute the laws of the land? Well, if it were the case that rulemaking were done without congressional authorization, that would be a serious problem. So rulemaking, the first question we ask, the first question I personally ask is, is there legal authority from Congress to act? That is the foundation stone for every exercise of rulemaking authority that the executive branch legitimately engages in. So. Okay. So in order, if, if you were taking to the other end, if we were, to, and, and right, I'm just doing a hypothetical. We said there aren't going to be any rulemaking authority. There's, it all has to go through Congress. What you're saying, though, right now is that Congress has given the executive branch too much of this power. Well, I wouldn't want to say too much, but I'd say that the exercises of legitimate rulemaking authority are congressionally authorized. Are there any exceptions that you see to that? Uh, 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 well, the, the, the President has some constitutional authorities that uh, may uh, relate to rulemaking, but that, that would be very limited. Thank you. Time has expired. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chaffetz. I yield to Mr. Labrador. Mr. Chairman, I have no questions. I yield back to the Chair. Thank you. Let, let me follow up on a few things that Mr. Chaffetz was saying. Um, it, it's hard for me to find a rule out there that I couldn't find at some point some benefit for. If I look hard enough and you allow me to be able to pick the assumptions, I can say this will prolong life for certain people, this will help the economy in some country, ours or some other place, this will help somehow the global environment. Uh, just about everything that we could do, if you allow me to create the assumptions, I could come up with enough benefit to say, yes, we should do this. I know it is going to cost $75 million, but we should do this because it will benefit the economy over the next 50 years. $75 million. Uh, so the cost benefit weighs out. The difficulty of this becomes how do we evaluate that? And the, the previous question that you were just referring to, do we have authority to do this? Uh, is this constitutional? Uh, is this the right thing to do within our, within our free republic? Or are we imposing arbitrary rules on people because we have a preference and we think at this point this is a good idea, knowing full well if the politics change and the presidency change and the executive office changes, they may switch it right back, as this administration 
you know, released some of the old rules and said, no, we are not going to do those, we are going to do it differently. Uh, what we want to have is a stable environment that is not just at the whims of the executive branch, it is constantly moving on state and local governments, tribal governments, and private business. How do we balance that out, where it is not preference-based with some benefits out there in the sky? Okay, great. Um, uh, the new executive order, I think for the first time, actually, has prominent references uh, to predictability and reduction of uncertainty. Great. So especially in this economic environment, to have people uh, uh, surprised by rules or hit on the left and hit on the right by rules that they didn't, that, that's a real problem. Um, in terms of the avoidance of arbitrariness, uh, uh, you are clearly right that uh, costs and benefits um, can be in the eye of the beholder, and it is possible to have manipulation of the process. Correct. If, if I say that global warming is caused by manmade pollution, suddenly everything that we do that ever relates to global warming, it is we are saving the planet. What value can you put on the earth? So everything, it, whether it is $100 billion, it doesn't matter. We are saving the planet. Yes. What we have tried to do, and I think there is real continuity, actually, uh, over uh, many years in this effort, is to uh, have a pretty disciplined method, at least in the domains that are the kind of staple of government rulemaking, so that if someone says, I guess your number was something like $70 million, that we have over the next 50 years $70 million of benefit to, to justify that, that $70 million can't be just asserted or a political preference. It has to be earned by reference to evidence. So uh, uh, the fuel economy rule is, is, is pretty strong. It, it, this isn't uh, weak stuff. Uh, the benefit figures that were given uh, have um, uh, been, th been through the ringer. Correct. But in, in the same in the same preference there as Mr. Kelly was referencing before, uh, those rules you change, for instance, the fuel economy standard, which does save us fuel, which does all of those great dynamics over the life of the car, if it also makes a lighter weight car and someone dies in a crash, how do you evaluate the, the benefit? That is an extremely important question, and that is something that we, me, meaning not just the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, but the Department of Transportation, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Council of Economic Advisors, right. look extremely carefully at. So but, that's, have, but that is the challenge, because once you start getting into those assumptions and you start evaluating it, it is very difficult for me to be able to say, let us hand that to an agency. And if private industry or if the government, the state and local tribal government, has a problem with that, considers it onerous, then the agency itself evaluates it and says, no, we like our rule, we are well, going to keep it. That, that is the challenge. And I know it is not that simplistic, no, 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 uh, but they go through the feedback, they go through the end of it, but at the end of the day, they can still say, no, we are keeping it. It is a, a very important point. And if you look at our guidance on the regulatory look back, that is the guidance the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs issued, it tried uh, uh, to produce independence between those evaluating the effects of the rules and those who wrote the rules. Right. For, for just because of the concern you mentioned. Still within the same agency, though. It can be still so within it's the down the hall, but it is still within the same agency. Well, there is some separation. And, and note that uh, if, if the, the numbers aren't, in, aren't good, uh, there, there are checks, both internal and external. Okay. So there are a number of occasions where uh, a, a projection of, of costs has been, uh, let us say, optimistic, and an internal or external review has, uh, has helped. But you would not uh, suggest that we have a judicial review process or a legislative review. Well, that may come back over here if there is a question that it comes back over the legislative determination to say that this was the legislation, the regulations written, and it doesn't fulfill legislative intent. I think the judicial review generally is required by the Administrative Procedure Act. It has uh, bipartisan support. On the particular question. Not an UMRA, though. Uh, th yeah. That is a question for people who have other roles than my right. implementation role. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just to be able to catch you up, that uh, we have gone through the initial round. Mr. Labrador just deferred uh, his question to me, and now we are going to start the second round. So I get to reload and do five minutes again. Thank you. Let, let me get a chance to, to continue on then. Uh, referencing something, you, you, you noted the um, uh, 13563 on predictability and uh, uncertainty. Is there a benefit in setting rules when they are set, whether it may be UMRA and there an unfunded mandate that is coming down or whatever significant rule may be coming out, and also giving a timeline? that lengthens that out. For instance, for a State government that only meets every two years in their legislative branch, if they suddenly have a rule that is now going to start 
18 months from now, but they just finished their legislative session, that they have to call in a special section to figure out how to be able to budget for something that is coming down on them. H how is that warranted, and how do we start establishing a time period for these? It is a great point. Uh, uh, one place where the President has clearly signaled this is in the Small Business Memorandum, where he called out that part of the Regulatory Flex Act that refers to delayed compliance dates. But is that a waiver that needs to be done, or is that something that needs to be established as a process to say regulation cannot go into effect until? Okay, great. Okay, so the the first question is whether the law allows consideration of delayed compliance dates for small businesses or for anybody else, state and local government in particular. And not infrequently, the law does give the executive branch some discretion in terms of timing. Uh, so that is the, that's the first question. Then the second question is whether the deli delayed compliance date is important to protect predictability, especially perhaps in a very difficult economic time, or whether in some cases it would delay uh, very important public health benefits. And, and that is an assessment that is uh, uh, common. Right. Well, there is a significant challenge for a local municipality. The Department of Transportation says your street signs are not reflective enough. So you have to change all of your street signs. Uh, they get some allotment to be able to do that through a grant. There is not enough. And now they are having to determine to make the deadline, do I pay police officers and firefighters or do I put in new street signs? Uh, it, it suddenly becomes this whole challenge of if they were given more time. Now, the battle of that is you shouldn't also have a thousand waivers sitting on your desk and be able to decide back and forth who gets it and who doesn't, but to establish some sort of process for that. That's, that's what I'm suggesting. Uh, uh, bringing back up the independent agencies, uh, we have a lot of independent agencies. And by the way, this was very helpful. This is your book, Risk and Reason, uh, going through an all, obviously, perspective in 2002 that you wrote about OIRA and some of the details in that was, was very helpful to be able to go through in preparation. But you made a statement in there about OIRA should, see, should also see as one of its central assignments the task of overcoming governmental tunnel vision by ensuring that aggregate risks are reduced and that agencies focus on particular risks, and that does not mean their ancillary risks are ignored or increased. So avoiding this governmental tunnel vision, I think that is a great statement to be able to make. The difficulty becomes in the independent agencies. How do we engage with oversight in the independent agencies? And do you see one of the independents that is out there that you would say they should not have oversight, they should have tunnel vision and be allowed to have that? Well, um, because the independent agencies aren't covered by the executive order. Correct. Or UMRA. <laughs> um, or UMRA. I'll, I'll have to be uh, a little uh, cautious in, in discussing them. Uh, I'd just add two points. One is that uh, noticing concerns of the sort to which you just pointed, and my voice is genuinely failing. It is not failing because Sorry. of the difficulty of the question. <laughs> it wasn't uh, that hard of a question. No one worried about it. <laughs> um, uh, we have asked the independent agencies voluntarily to comply. How many of them have voluntarily complied? At, at this day, we haven't uh, gotten the returns in. But if past history is, uh, if past is prologue, the likelihood of 100 percent compliance uh, is not something you want to bet on. Okay. With the with the request, uh, uh, so our, our uh, that is the Office of Information Regulatory Affairs has limited tools uh, given. And, and uh, that and that is part of my concern. Let me give you for instance the new CFPB group. They would be exempt from the executive orders and oversight. They would be exempt from UMRA as they come in as an independent. How do we keep a group with so much authority and so little accountability from getting this tunnel vision that you talk about in your book? Well, it is a, it's a very important question. And uh, uh, the, since we are narrowly focused on implementation as OIRA oh, administrator, I don't, don't have a position on that, but uh, uh, it is a very important question. And if there is legislation that is proposed, I am sure the appropriate people would be. There, there will obviously be significant rules that will come out of those, many of them with millions of dollars of impact on the economy, just based on the basis of how it comes out with Dodd-Frank. We suddenly have a group with no accountability to anyone, and when there is an issue that arises, who checks unfunded mandates with an agency that is that large? So with that, I would like to be able to defer to Mr. Connolly, my ranking member, for five minutes of questions. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Sunstein, um, a couple of things. Uh, I am sorry, uh, our full uh, committee chairman, Mr. Issa, is not here. Uh, he took some exception to the characterization of the adoption of H.R. 1 uh, earlier this year uh, as a partisan budget when 
only members of one party vote for it and not a single member of the other party vote for it, I don't know that that is a uh, normative statement. I think it is just a factual statement. It is a partisan budget. Um, he made reference to a shift in direction from the Obama, um, the Obama administration to the uh, um, and from the Bush administration to the Obama administration, and his specific reference, I believe, had to do with a mining issue, uh, the issue of permits under regulatory review. Now, it is my understanding that some of the strip mining permits granted under the previous administration were, in fact, in violation of Federal law under the Clean Water Act. Is that the case? You know, our role is not in, in we don't have a role with permits except insofar as there are rules behind the permit process. So I would uh, uh, plead a limited role with respect to that question. But you might agree that if a subsequent administration finds that, you know, deliberately or inadvertently there is, in fact, by the issuance of a permit, the circumvention of existing statutory framework with respect to regulation, the it is incumbent upon that administration to enforce the law. I would agree with that. And therefore, the issuance of permits be revoked. Well, on that question, I would want to look in the details. Uh, with respect to this subject, mining, have there been any loss of human lives uh, in the mining industry in the last 10 years? Yes. Um, does Federal regulation cover that industry? Uh, yes, we does. Do. it constitute an undue burden on the mining industry? Uh, the rules that have been proposed and issued uh, in this administration have been carefully scrutinized uh, to make sure there is compliance with the law and with existing executive orders. And insofar as they are uh, not finalized but proposed, we are eager to uh, hear what people have to say. But presumably, again, we, we use that word externalities, but I mean, the value of a human life, the prevention of the loss of it, has to factor in to the decision about whether or not, A, to enforce regulations and or new regulations, and, I mean, uh, to impose, and secondly, to enforce those that are existing. Is that not correct? That is a, cr a crucially important point. And uh, the fact is that the net benefits of regulations in the first two years of this administration are significantly higher actually three times those under the Clinton administration, more than three times those in the first two years of the Clinton administration, and a main reason is life-saving initiatives. You, uh, in response, uh, I wasn't clear in your response to our friend, uh, my colleague, Mr. Kelly, his questions. Uh, like, he, like him, I spent 20 years in the private sector, uh, more in the technology realm, so I intersected with the Federal Government regulatory frameworks in technology. Uh, before I came here to Congress, but I also served, like he did, in local government for 14 years. Um, I, I, could you expand a little bit on what is the current process for the opportunity of the private sector, or for that matter, the public sector, to participate in the formulation of new regulations or a review of existing ones to streamline or eliminate or make better? Okay, great. Thank you for that. I will give you a, a bunch of uh, opportunities people have. Um, and they won't be in sequence, but they are all really important. Uh, if there is a rule pending before the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, we have about 125 right now, uh, our doors are open at both the proposed and final stage for people to come in and express their concerns. Uh, this is uh, very important and perhaps not sufficiently appreciated, the availability of the process. By the way, the agency, the rulemaking agency, will be present also to hear the concerns. And that is something that happens a great deal. It could happen more. Uh, under the President's executive order, before a rule is proposed, if feasible, agencies should be engaging with State and local officials uh, to see whether the rule makes sense. And so for rules that affect their interests, and that could, this could be well under $100 million annually, it could be an exemption for one or another reason from, the, uh, from, the, from UMRA. There is supposed to be engagement before the fact. Then there is an opportunity, after the rule is proposed, to engage uh, through the comment process. And while it seems a little uh, dry and, and perhaps formal, one thing I have learned in government is, yes, it is dry, but it is not formal in the sense of empty. It, it really matters that uh, many people in agencies, and I personally spend a lot of time, 
it is a little pathetic on my part, to be sure, to be studying regulations.gov uh, and the comments that come in from State and local government at night, but, but I actually do, because you often learn a great deal about something that is maybe uh, not going in quite the right direction and it, you can make it better. Then at the, uh, the so there is that stage of commenting. Then at the final stage, agencies not infrequently engage before they write the final rule with State and local government, and that is consistent with the President's executive order. And also when the final rule comes over to OIRA, there is an additional bite at the apple. Now, you refer to the, uh, the look-back process, which is an unprecedented and, in that sense, historic uh, effort to look at the regulations uh, now on the books. And this has gotten uh, a lot of bipartisan enthusiasm. The agencies went out to the private and public sectors, uh, most cabinet-level departments and agencies, asking for comments via the Federal Register. But that is just the beginning. The plans that will be announced soon are under the executive order by design preliminary plans. And under guidance we issued, taking note of many of the points that have come up today, uh, and maybe we will be able to do a better job now that we have I and, and we in back of me have heard these concerns, we will have a, a public process where if people think the plans are uh, too aggressive, maybe, in the deregulatory area, then that is important to hear. If they think they are too weak, if they have no other ideas for cost reduction, then there is a great opportunity. So uh, this is um, really taking the open government goal uh, uh, with uh, a new level of seriousness in the rulemaking process. Thank you. Uh, defer to Mr. Labrador, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a quick question. Um, is there a point of diminishing returns in regulation? Uh, yes. And when does that point occur? Um, offhand, where the costs of increased stringency are higher than the benefits. Okay, so I will give you an example. A lot of the mayors in my cities uh, in Idaho are complaining. And these are bipartisan, Republicans, Democrats, Independents. They are complaining because they are being asked to clean the water and get rid of phosphorus in the water. And they are going to be spending billions of dollars over the next 10 years. And the, the uh, improvement is going to be by 0.5 percent. So from something like 2 percent of phosphorus in the water to 1.5 percent. And obviously, this is going to cost money to fix it, and it is going to cost businesses. Um, at what point do we start realizing that uh, the difference between 2 percent and 1.5 percent is not worth the cost? It is a really important point. And on the particulars, mm -hmm. I would want to study the details. Mm -hmm. But if it turned out that it cost billions of dollars over the next 10 years, then the question is, what do you get on the other side? Is it significant ecological and human health benefits? That would be one thing. If it is not, that would be another thing. So how do we study that? Is that something that we can send to you and you can look at? Uh, we would be happy to look at it. Um, if it stems from a rule, mm -hmm. then, then that is really our lane. Mm -hmm. uh, we would be happy to look at it and engage with the agency. But the question you are asking is under the President's executive order, kind of our staple, which is, is that increased level of stringency really protective? Is it really mm -hmm. expensive? Is it worthwhile? Okay. Thank you. I yield the balance of my time for the Thank you. Uh, we will have the same challenge on dealing with that same issue on it. I mean, it, it could be that we would require every single driver and passenger of every single vehicle in America to also wear bubble wrap suits, you know, while they drive right. and say that they're not just seat belts, but bubble wrap. And it point, at some point it gets absurd. And, uh, but you can always say, but it will save <laughs> a life. And so we have to require that in balancing out the freedom of our nation. Uh, with any kind of owner's requirement and evaluating who determines whether it's owner's or not becomes the other challenge. Uh, you, you also mentioned the historic nature of the look back. I would agree that is historic. Uh, but there will also be uh, a lot of people very attuned to seeing what the agencies considered as things to be able to kick out. Uh, if they are choosing only certain regulations that came down during certain political times in our nation's history and say, okay, this one, this one, and this one we no longer prefer, uh, then that definitely becomes even more historic. Uh, where we are now clearing the deck of everything that doesn't meet our personal preferences of the day. Uh, so that is part of the challenge as well and part of the anxiety of watching the look back. It is a good idea. Uh, the application of it, though, will be interesting to see if it has political consequences with it as well. 
Um, we, we had spoken before about the issue of $100 million or $50 million in UMRA in those requirements, and as it is, you know, uh, allotted for inflation as well. Do you think that number is still the right number? Uh, 12,866 just does 100 million, period, without the inflation on it. Is that too high? Is that too low? Should it be 20 million? What becomes an unfunded mandate and economically significant? I, I, I think what I uh, can tell you is kind of our day-to-day -day operation and how it bears on that question. Uh, if under the President's executive order, uh, incorporating 12,866, the, the $100 million threshold not adjusted for inflation right. is, is met. Uh, then there has to be a whole apparatus, including a regulatory impact analysis, to tr try to make sure we have what you are uh, concerned about, which is an objective and kind of uh, scrutinized analysis of costs and benefits. Uh, the President's reaffirmation of the $100 million threshold um, uh, uh, fits well, I think, with our best practices in, in, in this. So that number you think is about right? I think it is fine. The only thing I would add is that if there is a $40 million or $50 million expenditure, under the executive order, that is, uh, we look carefully at that, too. So th that is a lot of money. So just to clarify on it, $100 million nationwide, so $2 million per State, added all together in aggregate, that suddenly becomes an unfunded mandate. Uh, that would be the, under Amr, you would have to adjust for inflation. Correct. But, uh, but have, with that qualification, yes. Right. Well, in, in Amr, the, the standard would actually be even lower because for State and local governments, it is actually $50 million uh, adjusted for inflation on it. But the, uh, let, let me ask this. Regulation is the fulfillment of a piece of legislation. Would you agree with that? Legislation comes first, regulation is filling in the details of it from there. When there is a question about regulation and if it is appropriate or inappropriate, who do you think is the best? entity to determine whether that regulation fulfills the legislative intent? Well, ultimately, the best is the Federal courts. That is what they are there for. Uh, before that, then the relevant lawyers uh, were the Justice Department and the General Counsel's offices, including the OMB General Counsel's office, okay. have, have a role. Is there, um, do you sense the, the judiciary branch not just determining whether this is constitutional or whether the actions are consistent with the law, uh, but is there a gain to be able to go back to the legislative branch to say what was the intent here, or do you think you ask re the administration can't determine what the intent is, and so you go to a third party and ask them what the intent is? Is there a gain to just send it back to the people who wrote it and say what is the intent here? Well, I'm a little out of my OIRA lane on that uh, question, but the Court's view is that the, uh, the best indicator of the views or intentions of the enacting Congress is the language and supporting materials of the enacting Congress. And the courts are typically wary of what uh, a subsequent Congress, which may have either different membership or different attitudes, thinks about the uh, judgments of its predecessor. So, yeah, the the, the so just just to be clear on it, when we're dealing with the judicial branch reviewing the regulatory intent, you would think that's appropriate. But if you're dealing with an agency doing something that the private sector or a state considers onerous, you think the agency should be the one to settle that, not the judicial well, branch on that one. Well, uh, ultimately, on onerousness, Congress has the final say. So, so that one should come back to the legislative well, branch. Well, to determine uh, uh, reasonableness and, uh, and legitimacy, the lawmaking authority is, is final. To, to determine legality, then the judicial judgment is, is, the, is the one. But we have had occasions over the last years where uh, an administrative action doesn't fit with the views of the current Congress, and then the current Congress makes a change. Terrific. Uh, with that, uh, yes, you sure may. Additional minute. Of question. Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask one follow-up to your line of questioning, Mr. Chairman. Um, given your answer to the chairman with respect to what constitutes an unfunded mandate, uh, would no child left behind become an unfunded mandate? You know that one. I'd want to look at the particular regulations and whether they meet the, the statutory requirements. Uh, the, the regulations under that statute have not fallen within the Unfunded Mandates Act. In fact, as the Chairman said, we have only had four in the last 10 years, none, none, none under that statute. Well, if I could commend it to your review, 
Uh, as somebody who ran the 11th largest school district in America, it cost a lot of money to implement No Child Left Behind, well in excess of $100 million. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, given the timeliness of it, the President himself has recognized some of the flaws in the legislation, and many of us certainly hear from our respective school districts about the fact that good intentions, though it may represent, it is an onerous burden. And remember that in lean times for State and local governments and, and school systems, it also represents an opportunity cost. Every dollar I have to spend implementing that, in addition to the cash outlay, is a dollar I am not investing somewhere else in the school system. So I would urge OMB to look at No Child Left Behind in a timely fashion so that Congress can benefit from your analysis before we consider legislation later this year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. You are you, very welcome. I would recommend to you, you use, it said it is an owner's regulation. You don't get to pick if it is an owner's regu regulation, only the agency does. That's right. <laughs> Just a little joke for you. <laughs> can, I, can I mention one thing with that as well, then I would like to be able to close out? Is there the opportunity you sense for an agency to say, here is a larger regulation, we think this is going to be over $100 million. If we break this up into five pieces of $20 million each, it is basically not taken in aggregate. Is it possible for an agency to break up a piece into multiple sections and to now say it is under the threshold because it is not one big piece, it is five smaller? It is possible. We haven't seen it. Okay. Well, hopefully we never will on that one. Thank you very much for coming to be able to testify today. I appreciate your input on this as we try to settle this issue. This is a piece of legislation that desperately needs repair, and uh, I am sure we will have very robust conversations on the solutions to repair it. Thank you very much for this. We stand adjourned.